In the 1600s, scientists made the first true microscopes and began exploring the miniature world. They discovered things that had previously been invisible because they were too small to be seen. One of the most famous discoveries was made by Robert Hooke, who looked at dead plant cells under a microscope. With this magnified view, he described the plant tissue as being built of empty blocks that looked like the barren rooms in monasteries, which were called cells. Not long after Robert Hooke published his findings, a Dutch scientist named Anton von Leeuwenhoek looked at the pond water and saw dozens of different types of bacteria, algae, and protists. They moved and swam through the water, clearly alive, even though they were so tiny they could only be seen with magnification. He named the tiny creatures animacules, which means little animal in Latin. No matter what you call them, these small sacks of water are something we care about a lot because just about every living thing is made of cells. I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. In this lesson, we're going to find out which materials are made of cells and which aren't. And we'll learn more about what cells themselves are actually made of. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Before we started class, I asked the chat if you were the first person to look through a microscope and you saw these small little kind of sacks of water that everything that was living was made from, what would you call them? And we had some great suggestions. Kate says minusculettes. Anna said life blocks. Riley said tiny people pieces or a TPP. <laughs> um, Dancing slippers suggested pods. CO Squad said tiny things, and SC and Super Marmot said little beasties and blocks. These are some great <laughs> ideas. I love it. Now, we talked last time about characteristics of life, and that although deciding what is living and what is not can be a little bit tricky, and there are things like viruses where there is disagreement. Some scientists say they're alive, sometimes scientists say they are not. One of the characteristics of life that most people agree on is that living things are made of cells. So let's find out what cells are and where that name came from. It all started with a scientist named Robert Hooke. This is a picture of him up here, we think. We don't know for certain if that painting of him done in the 1600s was really of Robert Hooke or not, because it turns out that another famous scientist, Isaac Newton, did not get along with Robert Hooke at all. Oh, that's right. He was and, a rival. Yes, they really disliked each other. But possibly that's what Robert Hooke looked like. We know for certain, though, that this is what his microscope looked like because he drew a picture of it in his book. That's a picture that, that he just drew? That is a picture that he drew in his book, Micrographia, and the microscope had two lenses, and then that big round ball that you see over on the side that was a round sphere of water and a candle flame would be behind it to focus the light. It was a difficult microscope to use, but he looked through it at cork cells and this is more or less what he saw. So on, the, on this side, we have human cells. These are white blood cells called mast cells. And mast, can you kind of draw, draw the border? So that is a cell and this is a cell. Do they look empty to you? I'm seeing a big purpley thing inside. No, that not only do they have a big purple thing inside, they have all these other little spots. They are full of stuff. But now look at the cork cells over on the other side. Okay, so these do look pretty empty. They do look very empty because they are dead cells. Oh, wait, 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 what, what is cork? What is cork? Let's go to our next slide. Cork is actually from a tree. So if you see a, you know, a bottle that has a cork in the top to keep the liquid inside and then you pop that cork off, that piece of cork actually came from the bark of a tree. The tree is called the cork tree and the bark is actually dead. Just like the hair on my head, if I get a haircut, does it hurt when I cut my hair? No. No, because this is not living. This is actually just protein that was made by cells, but it's not cells. Same thing with cork. This is actually dead tissue. And so here is all tree bark dead tissue? Yes. Well, it depends on the type of tree, but almost all trees, the outside bark is dead. It's not living anymore. Wow. 
Uh, that's kind of cool. I guess I never thought about where it came from before. And this right here. That is the picture that Robert Hooke drew in his book. And he said that since they look empty, he called them cells because they look like the empty rooms in a prison or in a monastery. You know, a bare room is called a cell. And so he said, I shall call these cells and the name stuck. Oh, wow. And he drew this by hand. Yes. Is that what you're telling me? Yep, he did. Whoa. He's a good artist. He is a good artist. Now, we mentioned hair, and it's important to know that although living things are, for the most part, made of cells, sometimes you have things like the bark on a cork tree or a hair that grows out of your head that is not made of cells or is made of dead cells. So is a hair made of cells? Well, only this part at the bottom, only the follicle has living cells. The rest is just strands of protein stuck together. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it's made of what? Proteins. So you have these cells, they start out as cells, but then they're stuffed full of keratin. They are keratinized and that protein comes out. And by the time your hair is coming out of the skin, it is not living anymore. And it's not made of cells. It's made of protein. But, but didn't they just stuff the keratin in the cells? But then those cells got mushed together, oh. and but eventually they don't they don't actually have a cell structure. Gotcha. Now let's go to our next scientist, who also discovered cells early on, not very long after Robert Hooke, but he had a better microscope. So Robert Hooke was able to see the dead cells in cork, but he actually couldn't see much deeper than that, and he didn't he didn't see the small animals that Antony von Leeuwenhoek saw. Leeuwenhoek's microscope was super small. You could hold the entire thing in your between your fingers like this, and inside that microscope was the smallest lens. It was really just like a super powerful magnifying glass because there was only one lens, but with that lens, he could see up to 200 times magnification. So when he looked at pond water, he was actually able to see single celled animals swimming around. One of them that he saw was called Euglena and it looked a bit like this. Ooh. So if you looked through a microscope for the first time and you saw this little green thing swimming around, what would you call it? Like a mini snake or something, a worm? <laughs> it does look kind of like a worm. But it's green like a plant. It is green like a plant. And when scientists first tried to classify this organism, Euglena, they had a hard time because it is green and it does photosynthesis just like a plant. But it also will actually hunt and eat other tiny things. So instead of being an animal or a plant, they said, we need a third category. And they a called it- Plantimal? They called it a protist. But plantimal is another <laughs> good name. <laughs> now- I can't get over this microscope. You're saying- this doesn't look like a microscope to me, but th this is actually... It was actually a, a better microscope than Robert Hooke's microscope because the quality of the lens was so good. And with microscopes, it really does come down to how good is your lens. That makes a huge difference. And I'm seeing a great, great little suggestions in the chat for all the things that you might call a small animal like this if you looked at it. He called them animacules, animalcules. And I think it's a really cute and adorable name, but the name cell is the name that stuck around. And that's the name we use now to talk about the things that make up us and little single celled tiny creatures that are made of a cell as well. Animalcules though, you gotta just say that's a really cute name. It's like molecules, but it's animalcules, like it, the building blocks of bigger things. It is a cute name, but what is a cell? What is a cell made of? Well, to understand that, I actually think it's nice to look at a balloon. So I had Math Dad fill a balloon with a little bit of water now. This balloon is surrounded by what? Well, it's the rubbery latex balloon. Yeah, just the rubber latex of the balloon. So it has an outer covering and inside we have water. And at their essence, that's really what cells are. They're sacks of water. And it's like that Star Trek episode where they, they meet this new alien race and when it's talking to them it's like hello ugly bags of mostly water <laughs> it is really our, our our life forms are based on water and a cell is mostly water so if you were to weigh a cell 
most of the weight would be water, but this membrane is super important. And the membrane doesn't just keep the inside of the cell inside and keep the outside outside. It also helps the cell communicate with the world around it. It protects it and it filters things. So food can go in and waste can go out. The membrane is the most important, one of the most important parts of the cell and every single cell has a membrane. So in the, in the chat there saying that cells are basically miniature water balloons. That's a good way to think about them. But instead of being wrapped in latex rubber, they are wrapped in a membrane. So we are going to learn four parts of the cell today. And then on Monday, we'll talk more about them. But the membrane is one of the most important. Another thing, another cool word for our cell parts is cytoplasm. That's what we call the water inside the cell. So, so inside the cell, it's... It's just filled with cytoplasm, like if you shook a cell, it would... Yes, and the cytoplasm is almost entirely water, but there are going to be salts and other little things floating around inside there. And one of the most important things that's floating around inside every single cell is a ribosome. Isn't that a cool word? Ribosome. Ribosome. And we will learn a lot more about ribosomes, what they do, why this little cartoon version has something running through it. We'll learn a lot more about that in a couple weeks but I just wanted to make sure that you saw that word ribosome. All right, and for the chat, everybody who's saying we should pop the balloon, no messes, no, no, no. <laughs> There's a reason my math dad was like, well, I wanna be the one to have the balloon because he was worried that if he gave it to me, I might do something sneaky with it, like try to pop it. And our last term that we're learning today about cells is nucleus. Some cells have a nucleus with DNA and in other cells, the DNA is just floating around inside the cell loose. And on Monday, we're gonna learn a lot more about the difference between cells that have a nucleus and cells that don't. And now, hmm. Matt, if you can make us bigger for just a second, you will see on our schedule that we have the laser microscope activity today. And I'm super excited for you guys to get to build a laser microscope. But when we were thinking about all the things we wanted to teach today, we felt like we just didn't have time to do both. So we actually have something kind of cool. In four hours, we are going to premiere a video that's all pre-recorded about how to do a laser microscope. It'll be on YouTube. We hope you can join us, but if you can't join us live, you can watch the recording anytime this weekend. And it will be the next video in, in the course that you'll see. One reason we wanted to, to record it in advance is because it's kind of finicky. Basically what you're going to do is take a laser pointer and you're gonna sh shine it through a drop of water and what comes out the other side will look pretty cool. We'll be able yes. to see lots of tiny things. And you can see actual cells swimming, but- Animalcules? You could call them animalcules, <laughs> you could, but it is a little bit hard to do live because sometimes it works really well and other times you have to, you have to play with it. But there will be some troubleshooting involved. So go into this one with a patient attitude. All right, before we do polls, there are, I wanna bring up the notes really quick and talk a little bit about how you can tell the difference between living things and non-living things. So if you can pull up the notes real fast, Math Dad. Okay, I've got, we went too far. No. The notes. Oh, the actual notes. The actual notes. Oh, okay, the so. notes with the cartoon and the drawing. Oh no, I didn't erase the notes. It's okay, Math Dad. The chat will only tease you a tiny, tiny bit. Right. So first of all, in the notes today, we've got a pretty, cool comic that we're not going to read during class, but it's all about the discovery of the cell and those early microscopes, the th things we kind of talked about already. So enjoy those comics. But then comes a question. Is it made of cells or not? And we've got multiple options here. We want you guys to weigh in. We're going to classify just a couple of them in class, but then we hope you'll finish out this little exercise on your own because sometimes it's really easy to tell other times it's not. So let's start with salt and pepper. Is salt made of cells? What do you think? Salt, is salt made of cells? Well, it's definitely tiny. It is tiny. And I'm watching the chat to see if anyone can give us an answer Answer and a reason why. Is salt made of cells? What do you think? Mm. The answer is no. So let's put salt in the category of not made from cells. Good job. It is not made of cells because salt is a mineral. And a cell might have a little molecule of salt in it, but if you get a whole bunch of salt together, that is similar to having a whole bunch of gold or carbon or some other element. There are not gonna be cells in the salt. What about pepper? Pepper is something that you also put on your food. 
and it goes with the salt. It often is right next to salt. Mm. But pepper comes from a tree. Ooh. And I see shout out to Ella who says no, because salt is a mineral. And that is exactly right. Pepper comes from a tree and parts of it would be made of cell because pepper is essentially a little seed and it comes from a tree. So it used to be alive. Oh, so when we kind of grind up the seed and that's the, the, the pepper flakes. And that's that the we... pepper flakes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Shout out to Shannon and Kristen who said pepper is a plant. And if it comes from a plant, then it was alive. That was a little harder. Yeah. It was a little harder. What about yogurt? So what do you guys think? Is mm. yogurt made of cells or not? It's, Does de it it's delicious. I know that much. Yogurt is delicious. Is it going to have cells in it? Mm. If you look at a yogurt label, you might see it say live cultures on the side. And it says live cultures because yogurt is made from a bacteria called acidophilus. And the acidophilus bacteria actually changes the milk into yogurt. So did the milk have, you know, was the milk completely made of cells? No, not really. Milk, sort of like hair, is something that is produced from cells, but it's not completely made of cells. It's mostly water. True. But when you add bacteria to milk, you get yogurt. Now, the last one that we're going to do is sand, and I want you guys to weigh in with a reason. So type in the chat if you're watching live, is sand made of cells or not made of cells? So, so yes or no, but then why? Include a reason, reason why. Why is sand made of cells or why is it not made of cells? This is a good question. It is a really good question. Huh. If you think it's such an easy question, I, I wouldn't have to think so hard, but... Uh... I'm, I'm surprised at how complicated these can be. Elsa says, no, sand is not alive. It's made of minerals. Yes. It's made of Millie. Snamir says, no, because it is a rock. Millie says it's made of minerals. Will says, just a rock. Ibrahim says, no, because it's not living. You guys, these are great, great questions. Let's go ahead and look at some pictures. I'm also seeing some yeses in there. So. Yes, yeah, so let's go look at some pictures. It turns out that it all depends on what type of sand you're talking about. So this sand is from a sand dune in southern Utah, Kanab, Utah. These are quartz grains. So quartz is a mineral. A lot of rocks have quartz in it. And this is sand that has been around for millions of years. And because it has been around for so long and it has been blown around and eroded for so long, the grains are incredibly tiny. This picture of the sand was taken with a microscope. If you look at it normally and you get it on your hands, it's so fine, it just slides off and in between, and you can hardly see the particles. It's beautiful. So is this made from cells? No. Not at all, it's just a mineral. What about this sand from Hawaii? This is from a red sand beach, and you can see these particles are bigger and they're not as smooth. It's like lava rock, right? It is, it is small lava rocks, so also yeah, lava not rock, alive. Lava rock, not, not alive, not made of cells. Yeah, not made of cells yeah. at all. And here are three more samples, each from Hawaii. In Hawaii, you have green sand beaches, black sand beaches, and there is actually a glass sand beach. And this is really kind of cool and surprising. A long time ago, garbage was dumped on this beach and a lot of the garbage was glass. And the, the glass bottles, some of which were red and some of which were green and some of which were white and some of which were brown, they got broken up and those pieces turned into sand size fragments. And now the sand on that beach is literally made of different colors of glass. Isn't that <laughs> kind of cool? And they're not sharp. These have been tumbled around in the ocean for so much time that they're similar to the black sand beach pieces. Wow. And then this sand is really a cool type of sand because each of these little grains grows like a pearl grows in an oyster. So the Great Salt Lake is so salty and there's so much calcium in it that small bits of dust have this calcium carbonate grow around them and you get this very, very fine sand where each piece is perfectly round. How do you say that? Oohite? Oohite. Oohite sound. Wow. So all of these types of sand that we just talked about, not alive, did not come from cells. But this beach, Almost everything here did come from cells. Wait, is this sand too in this picture? This is sand through a microscope. So this is a white sand beach in the Philippines. And through a microscope, you can see, holy cow, this is a piece of a shell. 
These are pieces of coral. This is a sea urchin spine, and this is a sea urchin spine as well. Every single piece of white that you see here either came from a living animal or um, coral, which is an animal with algae growing in it. Isn't that amazing? That is pretty crazy. So you're saying sand can be made of cells. Sand can be made of cells. And a white sand beach, especially in a tropical lo location, most of that sand is going to have come from living creatures. And if you had a powerful enough microscope to look through it, this sea urchin spine is made of cells. It's not alive anymore because it's been broken and tumbled around in the ocean for years and years. But if you looked through a microscope, you would see cells. And a lot of beaches are a mix of the two. This sand from Duck Island, North Carolina, you have quartz, which is a mineral, but you also have, look, this is a piece of a shell that has been broken and then weathered. You have both. So any beach that is near the ocean where you are going to have animals in the water and shells, you will end up with shell fragments in the sand. And those came from a living animal. So sand, if you're filling out the notes, sand should go in both categories. Sometimes it comes from living things. Sometimes it comes from non-living sources. Yeah, so, so kudos to those of you in the chat who said both, or it did depend. Yes. And one more quick, cool fact. If there's a tropical beach and parrotfish live off that beach, they actually produce an incredible amount of sand because coral is an animal that builds this calcium carbonate skeleton. And when you break down that, it really gets, it gets broken down into sand. And the parrotfish will eat huge bites out of the coral. The algae, it digests. And the inner part of that coral skeleton it actually poops out as sand. <laughs> and one parrotfish, just one fish, can produce a thousand pounds of sand each year. Whoa. <gasps> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> now, uh, know, is that parrotfish big? The parrotfish are, are they're pretty good sized fish. Oh. I'd say they're about, about that big. Now on Monday, we're gonna lot more, learn a lot more about different um, micro, different parts of the cell but I want to do a quick under the microscope before we have polls. So you can get itempool.com slash science mom slash live, get that link ready. But we have two little quick under the microscope mysteries to share with you. The first one comes from one of our students. This is from Carter from Massachusetts. So you're supposed to tell us what this is in the chat. Yes, guess in the chat, tell us what this is. What do you think this is that was recorded underneath the microscope? Hmm. Can you see it moving? And can you see how it has cute little legs? Six <laughs> of them, three on each side. Kate says water bear. That's right. Or, or a, and a Aaron, tardigrade, right? Yep, Aaron says tardigrade. And I'm seeing the whole entire chat now is filling up with water bear and tardigrade. That is correct. So that is our first under the microscope mystery. So they're the same name or same creature, different names? Different names for the same creature. And I hope you guys, if you have a microscope, I hope you will send us some submissions. And here is our second mystery real fast. What do you think this is? What is that? What is that in that picture, tell us what you think. And I'm seeing lots of guesses for leaf. Wow. Shout out to Bowser and Isaac and Pascal. Leaf is correct. This is a leaf from a favorite plant of mine that is called Phytonia argyronura. And it is just a beautiful little house plant. Here it is right here in real life so you guys can see it. And the leaves are gorgeous with those pink stripes. Isn't that a neat plant? It is. Okay, and I'm impressed. The chat figured that out really fast. Oh yeah, they did. You know what this means, Math Dad? It means you are going down with our polls. I think it means they used all their luck up on that question because they're going down on the polls. All right, we're at idempool.com slash science mom slash live. So if you click on the link, open it up in a separate tab. We have six questions that we'll go through really quick where you can test your knowledge on what we learned today. And then remember for our laser microscope activity in just three and a half hours from now, we will have a second stream. And if you can't join us live, you can catch it anytime this weekend where we'll go through more instructions. 
All right, our first question. Why did Robert Hooke choose the name cell for the small parts of the plants he observed? Mm. So the possible options are, they looked like tiny cell phones. It's from the Greek word for tiny. They look like they're made from cellophane wrap, or they looked empty like the unfinished rooms of monks. Which of those is the explanation for why Robert Hooke chose the name cells? Why did he choose the name cells? I think we have a clear winner in the chat, Math Dad. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer and see if they are right. All right, see if they were listening. And the correct answer is because they looked like the unfinished rooms of monks. They did. And if you had been the one to discover cells, who knows? They might be called life blocks or pods instead. There were lots of other names that could have been picked, but because Robert Hooke was the first person to publish and the first the cells he looked at were dead. He thought they looked empty. That's why we call them cells. Like jail cells. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. So I want you to select all of the items that are made of cells. We've got multiple options here. We've got carrots, a window, bone, sugar, milk. So which ones are made of cells? And remember, if it, don't just go through and pick all of them, because if one of them that's not made of cells has higher votes than another one, Math Dad will totally count that as a victory. And then instead of seeing a plank challenge, you'll see the bwahaha, <laughs> the gloating laugh. Ooh, so these two categories are getting a lot of votes. And there yeah. have been some fun questions coming in too. Musical Marmoset wants to know what's my favorite type of sand. That's a tough question. I would say my favorite type of sand is sand in a sand dune where the grains are all small enough and the quartz content is high enough that they actually will resonate and make sound. So they call these singing sand dunes booming or dunes. booming dunes. And if you slide down the face of the dune, there's this like this loud sound that will go out through the whole dune. It's really cool. Oh. That's my favorite type. All right. The answer is, oh, they got it right. So carrots Woo! are made of cells and bones are made of cells. You might think that no cells there, but they're definitely made of cells. So the other things that got a lot of votes though, um, milk got a lot of votes. You might find an, a, a cell or two in milk because milk is gonna come from an animal, from a mammal. But for the most part, milk is mostly water and protein and fat and sugars. It doesn't have a lot of cells in it. And the other one that got a lot of votes was sugar. So is sugar made of cells? No, but sugar does come from either sugar cane or sugar beets. And so since it comes from plants, again, if the process of making it was kind of sloppy, you might have a cell or two that might come in, but it is refined and concentrated and dried out and sifted so much that by the time you get to the end product, it's pretty much just sugar. So it's more similar to salt. Yes, to similar. There, sh there should not be any cells in your sugar. All right. Good job, you guys. Okay, question three. The blank accounts for most of the mass of a cell. Hmm. So is it the membrane, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, or the ribosomes? And here are some little pictures to help you remember what those words mean. And don't worry, we'll be talking a lot more about each of these in the next couple of weeks. I want to answer one quick great question that came in from Tung. Um, he thought said cells were too small to, to for light to reflect on. So how is it that that one cell was green? Great question. And Tung, you are absolutely right. The viruses are too small for the, they're smaller than wavelength of light. So viruses don't have any color. But with cells, there's a huge difference with size of cells. Some are so small that they're you know almost a virus size. They're super tiny. Others are enormous. In fact, one of the biggest cells of all is an egg. An ostrich egg technically is one cell. And the little <laughs> worm-like euglena creature that we saw, that is actually a pretty big cell. And that's, so, that's why you could see the green. Good question. Let's go ahead and reveal the answer. All right, they said cytoplasm and they are correct. Woohoo! Well done, guys. Good job. Cytoplasm is correct. All right, but we have two more questions. What did Liv Unhook call the little creatures he saw through his microscope? We'll see if they were paying attention. And I... can we just have a moment of appreciation for the brilliance of Leeuwenhoek's teeny tiny microscope? It's 
I swear, it cannot be a microscope. It doesn't look anything like what I'd expect. It's like the world's coolest magnifying glass. And it really was, I mean, like it was so tiny, you just hold it in your hand and then peer through that one lens. Wow. It's a cool design. Oh, I think they're getting this one. I think they paid attention. I think they did. That bar is pretty big, Math Dad. No evil laugh is coming from Math Dad. You guys are going to get to see the plank challenge instead. Pa patience, science, Mom. Patience. All right. Chat says animalcules. And, and that, that, that is yes. correct. Yeah. Little critters, your little varmints. That no, is correct. He, yep. He called them animalcules. Which means little animals in Latin. Okay. But this is the one where I stump them. So select all the items that are made of cells. We've seen a question like this before. We've got carbon, yeast, candles, cinnamon, tardigrade. So carbon, like graphite, is what most pencils have in the pencil lead. So that's why we've got that picture of a heart with a bunch of pencils around it. Mm. Wax in a candle. And then cinnamon, yeast, like what you use to make bread, or a tardigrade. Which of those are made of cells? Only mark the ones that are made of cells. Don't mark the other ones. It could be all of them. It could be none of them. Math Dad's trying to get you to pick all of them. Don't pick all of them because you want to see the plane challenge. No hints, science mom. No hints. Um, great, great question real quick from Kate. For the microscope experiment, I have water with cat saliva, old grass, and mud. Will that work? Those are interesting samples. So anything that you want to put in your drop will work. But, um, and you'll see when we, when, you, when we do our video in a couple hours, saliva is actually pretty tricky to see because saliva has all these proteins in it and it like gives a really weird pattern in the light. So any type of water that either a pet has been touching or licking, like a pet water dish or an aquarium or water from outside. But if you take water from a pond and it's super green and scummy, there will be so many cells in there that it will block the light and you won't be able to see anything. So the water needs to be kind of clear. Right. All right, let's reveal the answer. All right, looks like three categories got a lot of votes. Oh, they got it. Woohoo! I thought I thought I would get them with cinnamon. Because cinnamon's got, I don't know, it's a spice. And sometimes spices are... Cinnamon not... is from the bark of a tree. They just take, just like with cork, they take that tree and they peel the bark right off. All right. Oh. Last question. We are almost out of time. All right, but bonus question here. Although I don't think I'll stump you on this one. All right, what cell part is most responsible for protecting the cell and helping it to communicate and filter nutrients from its environment? Hmm. Is it the cytoplasm, the nucleus, the ribosomes, or the membrane? Which one? It's definitely one of those. It definitely is. And cool fact, tardigrades are have about a thousand cells. So sometimes oh, people so will say, like, is a tardigrade a single cell? No, a tardigrade is actually a little miniature animal, and most tardigrades are around a thousand cells big. So they have quite a few cells. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So they're crazy tiny, but not as tiny. Not as, as tiny as, as 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 a single cell. I think we have a clear enough winner, Math Dad. Let's reveal that answer. The membrane. Membrane. So so that the membrane is covering and it, it lets some stuff through. It does. It does. So the, the little picture that we saw of our membrane where, um, and just these are stickers that I made. If we can pull them up real fast. And just for fun, I did a little, oh, we've got to go past our sand real fast. There we are with the membrane. So I made these just for fun for alliteration. We said magnificent membrane, but you see where that little face is in the membrane, that little silly face, mm -hmm. that is a channel and it lets certain things go through and out of the cell. So it's not quite like a balloon that, that's, that's keeping everything in or everything out. Correct, correct. It can let things go through, out and about. All right, Math Dad, will you All grab right. Science Puppy super fast? All right, so I, I think the kids did oh, come out on right. top this time. So I, I will concede victory. Here we go, you guys, with the plank challenge. <laughs> Nice try, science mom. So I guess I was the one defeated in that one, but don't worry, math dad, the re rematch is coming. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Science Mom Jamie, Science Mom Amber, Science Mom Michelle, and everybody in the chat. We hope that you enjoyed learning more about cells. And don't forget that our laser microscope, again, we just felt like it was going to be too much to try and put it into this lesson. But we have a video for you that is at the bottom of the page in Teachable right now. And it will go live so that you can chat with us if you want. It is going to go live at 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm putting the link in the chat right now so you can bookmark it. And it's public. It's a public video, so you can share it with your friends, too. We'd love to have as many people as can watch it today and tomorrow so that hopefully when other people are looking for good homemade microscope videos on YouTube, they'll find our video. And if you guys take some good pictures of your microscopes and what you are seeing, we'd love to see them. Yes, yes. Again, you can use any type of laser microscope and most importantly, any, any type of laser pointer. Thank you, Matt, Dad. And most importantly, make sure you are safe with laser pointers. Don't ever look at them too long or shine them in your eyes. So work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you next time.